Sahana Vavatu Sahano Bunaktu Sahaviryang Karavavahai Tejasvina Vadita Mastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. As Haima was pointing out before uh, we began the session, we're just about at the end of this book, uh, Realizing God. And the next book we will take up by request is Swami Ranganathananda's Divine Grace. Uh, that's an 83-page book, but it may take us uh, at least uh, a month of Saturdays, maybe even six weeks, to finish it. Uh, it just depends on how much <clears throat> uh, discussion and commentary there is among those who come to uh, participate. After that, we'll take up the Gita, again by request. Uh, and the answer to your question, Nira, uh, you know, we're, we're about to come to the end of two other uh, texts. Uh, the book on Holy Mother on Tuesday and then uh, <clears throat> the uh, Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga. So we'll take up uh, We'll take up Swami Swahananda's book, Go Forward. It's his exchange of letters with Swami Primeshananda. And uh, it's just astounding in its clarity and depth of understanding from the Swami, who was an upaguru for Swami Swahananda. Um, of uh, how to handle the the challenges of studying the art of spirituality. So before we begin, and what a lovely group we have this morning, thank you all for coming. Uh, is there anything else from anyone uh, that uh, that we would like to take up? before we start with the, this morning's text. Thank you, Brother Shankara. It made me really happy that you said we're going to take up Swami Ranganathanandaji's book, Divine Grace, because it's a small book, but for me, it requires a lot of uh, stop and go. Think every few sentences sometime. Well, it's, it, is, it is a very, very potent uh, description of how to become a full human being that with the realization that to be fully human is to be fully divine. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, an, it's an amazing text for some, a book that's only 83 pages long. At the right time, at the right time, when that time comes in the book, you'll be able to answer the question for me. You have well, to raise your ego before you can give up your ego. Yes, you have to fulfill yourself. You have to fulfill your 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 potential as a as a human being. Uh, the 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 gifts that we have been given, which most people very lightly use. They don't really uh, become self-determined enough uh, to uh, to fully 
manifest the uh, the truth of their being, the uniqueness of their being. And so they constantly feel hemmed in. And anyway, we'll take that up when we take up the book. But uh, it's it's true that one must uh, manifest their <clears throat> potential, which can be thought of as the ego. The, the, the ego is only part of it, as we'll see. Anything else from anyone before we start on today's text? All right. We are, of course, studying Swami Prabhavananda's collection of talks published as Realizing God. And we are coming to the end of the talk on silence. Uh, any comments or questions about what we've read so far in this text. Okay. As you practice spiritual disciplines, the first understanding that comes is the isness of God. He is. I don't see him. I don't know him yet. But he is. This conviction comes, but only when we rend asunder this veil of ignorance. <clears throat> now, the Swami didn't choose the words rend asunder casually. It is an seeming, it seems to us, to be a great act of purushakara, self-effort, to rend asunder this veil of ignorance. And it means turning within, turning away from the five organs of action and the five organs of perception which keep us entranced with the changing, the ever-changing realm of time, space, and causation. It means turning away from that. And this is what we'll talk about tomorrow. When we talk about is there a proper attitude for the Raja Yogi? Because Raja Yoga is the process of turning within. And it's only there that we can rend asunder this veil of ignorance, because the veil of ignorance is persistent because of our five organs of action and our five organs of perception. It isn't that there's anything wrong. It's just limited. And so we'll never come to know God in the sense of his or her isness that the Swami is sp speaking about until we turn away. Then when we return, having experienced the isness of the divine, then we have a whole different attitude toward our organs of perception and our organs of action. Any comments or questions about that particular principle, since it is so key? The fact that turning away from them in the beginning is absolutely necessary to rend asunder this veil of ignorance. And then when we return to them, having rendered, rended asunder this veil of ignorance and come face to face or heart to heart with the divine isness, the divine presence, the living presence, as Swami Prabhupada called it. Any questions about that or comments from your own wisdom and experience? Okay. This conviction comes, but only when we rend asunder 
this veil of ignorance. Now consider that individuality is the first begotten child of ignorance, our sense of separation of individuality is the first begotten child of ignorance. Has it any reality? Often the question arises that we shall have to lose our individuality because our whole universe, as it were, is centered around this little ego. I want this, I want that, I seek this, I seek that, what remains if I give that up? Which is what is meant by turning away from the organs of perception and the organs of action. We, we stop, at least for that time being, uh, wanting this and seeking that. We seek something other within. What remains if I give that up? What happens to my individuality? If you analyze, you find that there is no such thing as individuality. You can't find that illusion centered around the ego. You can't find that illusion centered around the ego. For those of you who have read or studied Ramana Maharshi, you will see that this is precisely the core of his teaching. Just try to find that I. <clears throat> you simply cannot find it. You simply cannot find the I that you think is your individuality. Now, Swami Prabhupada was asked about this giving up of individuality and don't you lose everything, which was seen in one way, a rather comical question to ask an illumined soul who had obviously done this. And here he sits in all his glory, all his wisdom, all of his humor and engaging personality. What had he given up? So his answer was, no, my child, you don't lose anything, you gain everything. And that is exactly what he's talking about here. When we try to find that little ego and we, we plunge within and find that it's just all these mental impressions an ever-changing illusion of a reality that we project out of our desires and our aversions and our hatreds and our fears and our doubts and so on. We've created this whole veil of ignorance that covers the truth of that glorious being that was sitting there asked that someone asked the question of, won't I lose everything? So any comments or questions before we go on? Because this is, this is the heart of the matter. This is the stuff. This is the stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is the stuff. Shankara, this is Amadas here. Yes, Amadas there. Uh, this is so, uh, it resonates so deeply with me. Um, what comes up is my uh, relationship with alcohol and my alcoholism. Mm -hmm. I, for, I was, I almost, I almost didn't make it out of alcoholism because I just didn't want to give it up because I thought I was giving something up. And then once I was free of it, what I realized was that releasing alcohol from my life was the beginning of freedom. Uh -huh. And it's actually, I should be laughing hilariously right now because it was the, it's a, it's an enormous joke on me because I clung so, so tightly for decades. I knew all I had to do was separate myself from alcohol, but I, I didn't want to because I thought I was giving something up. 
Mm -hmm. And I absolutely gave nothing up when I eliminated it from my life. And nothing in my life right now is available if I was still drinking. Yes. So it truly did give me everything. Yes. And what what you gave up was a limitation, a system yes. of limitation. Right. Uh, that's what you gave up. And so right. when you give up limitation, as you say, what replaces it is a greater degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the the wondrous part about that is, is that there is no end to it. Yes, we are infinite beings and there is no end to our freedom. Uh, this is inconceivable to us as we think about it with our left minds, but all of the saints say it is so. As Swami Brahmananda, Swami Prabhavananda's guru said, there is no end to it, light more light, more light. There is no end to it. So. And go. just to jump on what Amidas said, you know, giving up something is hard to give up as an addiction. Um, it is quite a struggle. And most people don't aren't able to do it. Um, but it's a perfect opportunity <laughs> to see it for what it is. Like you you said, Shankar is a limitation. Um, and while addictions and things like that are, are some of the hardest to give up, everything is a limitation. Yes, exactly. Everything. And then everything when you said, of the... yeah, when you said there's no end to it, I take that to mean, uh, you know, the more limitations we're able to give up, the more of that unlimitedness we can mm -hmm. apprehend. Precisely. And apprehend is exactly the right word. It isn't understand, because understand is part of this limited left mind. It is apprehend, actually grasp, grasp, which is what apprehend means. So, yes. It is the limitations we are giving up, which is what the Swami meant when he said, you don't lose anything, you gain everything. And all of our limitations are made of our five action organs of action and five organs of perception. <clears throat> this is why we must turn away from them and turn within before we begin to grasp who we truly are, to apprehend who we truly are. As the Swami says, if you analyze, you find that there is no such thing as individuality as we understand it. You can't find that illusion centered around the ego. So anything else before we move on from this central point? Okay, so you can't find that illusion centered around the ego. You seek everywhere, and yet what the ego is, you don't inquire about. Behind the appearance of ego is the real self, the Atman, which is the self in every being, the Atman, the self in every being, which is not separate. It seems to be separate. That's why we speak of it as Atman rather than Brahman. It seems to be there's an Atman in there and in there and in there and in there. Yes, so it seems, but it's not the case the self in every being in which is one with God, one with the divine living presence. So we are each and every one of us manifesting what we refer to as an Atman, but at the same time, we're not understanding 
because of the veil of ignorance, that that is not a truth. That is a limited, a relative truth. It is the fact that we are one with all that is. Hmm. The self in every being and which is one with God, by this shadow of an ego, we are bound down. By this shadow of an ego, we are bound down. Sri Ramakrishna gave the illustration that it's like trying to find what's inside an onion. You peel off layer after layer after layer and come to nothing. It's just layer after layer of mental impressions and their effects, which come to us as our waking awareness, our active subconscious, which is also known to us as dream sleep, and our latent unconscious, our latent subconscious, which is also known as unconsciousness or dreamless sleep. All of these are there, these are categories we have created to understand what happens to us, but they are not a reality. There is only one being, one awareness, one consciousness that appears to us because of our because of what are these layers of an onion, as Sri Ramakrishna said, it seems to us that there's something there. It's like trying to find what's inside an onion. You peel off layer after layer after layer and come to nothing. What we think as our individuality, hmm? We are losing every moment. You are not the same person from moment to moment. What we think, I think there's a word missing, what we think of as in our individuality, we are losing every moment. You are not the same person from moment to moment. Now, this is inconceivable for us to understand, but it's one of the central tenets of Buddhism. <clears throat> you are not the same person from moment to moment. We create the continuity by projection. We think we're the same person from moment to moment because that's what we want to think. We don't want the, the somewhat frightening idea that it's all changing every moment, including us. You are not the same person from moment to moment. Your character changes, your mind grows, your body changes, everything that you have this, everything that you have that distinguishes you from others is always changing. Yet you have the consciousness that I am I. Seek to know what that I, that, what, seek to know that I. That is the Atman, that is Brahman, that is God. but we'll never find it in the beginning outside. We will never be able to reason ourselves there. We cannot apprehend the truth of our being by trying to understand it. This is why we do these classes the way we do. We do the hearing, we're reading these 
wonderful words of Swami Prabhupada an illumined soul and they fill us with this joy and this wonder but that's not apprehension we have to go beyond so we then do the manana part the discussion where you illumine this for yourself by sharing yourself and you help others grasp it apprehend it you get these glimpses through this process of studying the art of spirituality but in fact this seeking has to go on within us so any comments or questions from anyone anything from your own wisdom your own experience any concern that you have about what's been said or any question that you feel you'd like to raise um, brother shankara yes dear um i wanted to share something that came up in the um, vedanta life academy class on uh, sri ramakrishna and his divine play mm -hmm. uh, during the q and a sessions uh, one of the participants asked this question about that incident in um, that's described where uh, Mathur Babu is um, sitting and Sri Ramakrishna is walking about in the veranda. Mm -hmm. And Mathur Babu sees um, on one direction Shiva and the other side, I think it was Krishna. Mm -hmm. And so Mathur Babu couldn't believe his eyes and uh, he later asked Sri Ramakrishna about it and Sri Ramakrishna uh, denied knowing anything about it. Hey, well, so he that, just, he didn't den deny, he, it isn't an act of denial. He just said, I don't know anything about anything that. about it. So the, the person who asked the question asked Swami Atmarupananda for his interpretation of that particular interaction. So what uh, Swami Atmarupananda replied, to the best of my understanding, is he said there are two possibilities. One is, yes, uh, Sri Ramakrishna really didn't know um, what had transpired, or it could be that the Divine Mother was using Sri Ramakrishna's form to present uh, Shiva and Krishna. So that sort of made me think, why not I believe that everything is a manifestation of the Divine Mother? It's just that my veil is making me see it as this, that, or the other. And when she chooses, the veil will be lifted and I'll see what's true. Beautiful, beautiful. And it's interesting that the two explanations that uh, that Atmarupanandaji offered are not self, they're, they're not mutually contradictory. Both things could be true. The person, the personality of Sri Ramakrishna could know nothing about what the mother was doing at that moment uh, with uh, his uh, appearance to Mathur Babu both could be true at once thank you for bringing that up and it is a it is a and your apprehension of the fact that this is the divine reality we just aren't seeing it as such and the veil will be lifted torn asunder when mother is convinced that we're ready to have it be so <clears throat> Thank you, Swayam. Anything else from anyone? Okay. Uh, I have a question. So yes. I think long back uh, in the same meeting, you mentioned that uh, difference between understanding and apprehension. So how do you recognize that you have an understanding but not a apprehension? Well, you can you can intellectually understand everything that's being said here, can't you, Rajiv? There's nothing here that is so it doesn't confound your reason. There's nothing here that's unreasonable. You can understand it all. But does that mean that you know it in any sense of of really experiencing yourself as the Atman? rather than as the Rajiv that uh, just spoke and is changing every moment. 
but you don't perceive that either. You don't apprehend that either. Most of us don't. Very few of us do. The fact that uh, apprehend that we're changing every moment. It requires that you learn to be the witness, the witness uh, consciousness, which is the face of the Atman that presents itself to us, the Atman with attributes, Saguna Atman. That when you sit in that witness seat reliably long enough, you see everything is changing, including yourself, every moment. Now, I can say all these words and you can understand them. You're an intelligent fellow. There's nothing here that is beyond your ability to say, yes, I, I understand that. But the difference between that and apprehension is that we know it through our own personal experience, not through the words or experience of others. As Sri Ramakrishna says, no matter how much you watch someone else eat, it will not satisfy your hunger. Thank you, Rajiv. That's, it's good to make that distinction between understanding and apprehension. And is suffering something that breaks your shell so that you can have an opening to apprehension? Yes. Well, that, that is one of the reasons that Holy Mother says you come to see all suffering as a blessing because it breaks the shell of your, uh, this continuity awareness that we project. That's the shell. That's how I understand the word shell that you just talked about. We, we project this shell of continuity and we feel comfortable within that shell so to speak and then something breaks the shell and there is the opportunity for apprehension <clears throat> but as winston churchill pointed out many people stumble over the truth and then get then and then Many people stumble over the truth and then get up and walk on as if nothing had happened. So when we have these momentary apprehensions, you know, the, the slang parlance for this is, the slang way of saying it is, it's a wake up call. Wake up, wake up. Something, it's, this, it's not the way you, think it is. It's not the way you've projected it to be. Thank you, Rajiv. Anything else from anyone? Brother Shankar? Yes? Two thoughts. One, the difference between understanding and apprehension or apprehending, I believe it is very well explained by what you said earlier, quoting Swami Swahananda Ji, the true test of spirituality is the change in behavior. Yes. And second, that when the change in behavior comes, I would not know it myself. Others would perceive it. Well, sometimes we know it ourselves because it's come from the root of apprehension. And we see uh, things have changed. Hmm? You may not see it as something you decided to do, but it is because of your apprehension of something that it motivated the change. Thank you for recalling that, BJ. Thank yes, you. as Swami Swahananda said, the only true measure, the only true test of 
spiritual growth is change in behavior. The only true measure of your spiritual experience is that it results in a change in behavior. Otherwise, as he so often said, oh, that's a nice gift. You had some experience. And he would say, talk to me about it again in three months. Because if it was really profound, you will remember it in three months and it will have resulted in some change in behavior. Thank you, Vijay. Anything else from anyone? Okay. Shankaraji. Yes, Bala. I just want to, you know, the true change of behavior, we can see actually there was a, uh, one of the, you know, Swamis was telling about in Himalayas, all these Swamis to understand the same philosophy, they go to places where they get scolded by the people. In other words, they are trying to see because the Bhagavad Gita says, at the level of the body, you know, they're both, we have to look at the samatvam between the heat and cold. But at the level of the emotions, it is joy and sorrow. And at the level of the intellect, this is the uh, respect and irrespect of all these things. We have to learn how to behave equal with all those things. And for that reason, some of these Swamis in Himalayas, they go to places where they get scolded and then they see their reaction in themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that yes. is the, the best method to estimate our own, uh, you know, spirituality, how we are behaving for the world, you know, we are facing. Exactly exactly how we are behaving for the world we are facing. Uh, it, it reminds me of a, a story about the Desert Fathers. The Desert Fathers lived in solitude. They were called the Desert Fathers because they uh, separated themselves, lived in solitude, and did their spiritual practices. There were the Desert Fathers and the Desert Mothers. They, they both lived this way but the, the, they didn't meet together much at all. So, but there was a meeting of the desert fathers and there was among them, one that was senior, I've forgotten his name. And everyone spoke about their experiences. This is what the meeting was in part four. And this one young man came and talked about how much he'd gained, how much he, he'd wrestled with the devil and done this and done that in his solitude. And, uh, and he was really very um, uh, expansive about how much he had grown. And at the end of his presentation, the, the head of the Desert Father said, Yes, my dear young man, you can gain everything in solitude except character. And so this, as Balakrishna pointed out, is what these Swamis are doing when they go to those places where they get scolded. They are seeing what their character is and how, as, he, as Balakrishna pointed out, how they react to the scolding, to the criticism. Mm. And each one of us has the opportunity from time to time to discover that. <laughs> so thank you, Bala. That was very apropos, right on point. Yes, dear. Speaking of each of us has that opportunity to look within oneself and yet how hard it is for us to stop in the moment and look 
within oneself. Well, this is why the practice of contemplation, concentration, and and meditation, the practice of those three things is encouraged because out of that develops this witness awareness, this witness of the, being able to watch the mind and the emotions, watch the body-mind complex and watch the changes in the body-mind complex is called the citta, the mind stuff. Mm. Uh, it's constantly changing, it's constantly reacting to its environment, and uh, it has all manner of uh, reactions and actions that it takes in response, some of them quite automatic. The only way that we gain this ability to stop in the moment and see what it is it's going on as, as we, um, as we experience something like criticism or praise uh, <clears throat> and see how we're reacting to it. And this is only developed, only developed through the process of turning within in contemplation, concentration, and meditation. Thank you, BJ. Yes, it is, it is hard as we're barreling along, creating our universe out of our past mental impressions and our knowledge of name and form for us to recognize in the moment uh, our own responses because we'll react to those responses and, and go on creating. This is one of the things that is what uh, Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda stress so much. It is not that, of course, you need to develop that spirituality, but it is the manifestation of the spirituality. That is where that we have to realize is the same Atma we are looking at everybody. And whether we get the respect or disrespect or whatever it is, we just have to learn to let it go, thinking it is nothing but Bhagavan who is saying those things. Yes. <laughs> uh, in Song of the Sannyasin, Swami Vivekananda puts it this way, praise or praised, Blamer blamed are one. Praiser praised, blamer blamed are one. It is only, as you said, Bhagwan, the one that is speaking. And it's uh, when we understand what a privilege it is to participate in this at all, this study of spirituality and this opening out into less and less limitation, then we, we, we respond with reverence and awe and gratitude. What a privilege it is to be here this morning, to do this together, so rare, so rare, so rare. Anything else before reading? Okay, Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, before you spoke, I was just going to mention that um, I have often drawn upon this lines from Swami Vivekananda, uh, where <clears throat> praise or praise, blame or blamed are one when I have felt agitated um, because somebody said something. So thank you. And uh, I picked up the book and if it's okay, I would like to read that line, the whole uh, of that particular. Uh, Please, yes, go right ahead. Okay. He, um, uh, he then no more how body lives or goes. Its task is done. Let karma float it down. Let one put garlands on, another kick. 
This frame say not, no praise or blame can be. Where praiser praised and blamer blamed are one. Thus be thou calm, sannyasin bold, say om tatsatom. Okay, would you read that again, please, with a little more emphasis and a little more slowly? Okay. Heed then no more how body lives or goes. Its task is done. Let karma float it down. Let one put garlands on, another kick. This frame say not. No praise or blame can be, where praiser praised and blamer blamed are one. Thus be thou calm, sannyasin bold, say om tatsat om. Let karma float it down. Be the witness and just watch. And sometimes it's very trying, very agitating, particularly when, you know, it just gets so complicated and you just think, what is all this? Hmm? Well, it's nothing more than karma floating it down. But in the moment, it can be very difficult. So there's no sense pretending it's not. It can be very difficult and very challenging. But these are the words of Vivekananda, who himself, and if you study his life, his letters, you see he struggled, he struggled with attachment, with aversion, with anger, with desire. As, as, as both Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother pointed out, but more Mother more determinedly said that whenever a great soul takes human form, they are liable to all of the pluses and minuses of embodiment. So thank you for reading that, Swayam, and it is very apropos. Thank you. When we experience something different than what the Swami said, it's best for us to be calm about that too and simply sit in the witness seat and say, this are, these are the fruits of ignorance, not my ignorance. You don't have any ignorance any more than you have an ego. It's just the ignorance. And so, what we're doing this morning is listening to someone, Swami Prabhavananda, who can dispel that ignorance. Okay. Brother Shankar? Yes, dear. I hope I'm not interrupting your thought. No, that's fine. Uh, two questions. One, long time ago, Dear Swami Yogeshanandaji used to play on Sundays the music Knowing, Knower, Known as One. And on that, my question is, I see two interpretations of it. And you can tell me which one is right. One, that everything is one. Knowing, meaning knowledge. Knowing, Knower, Known, all three of them are one. The second interpretation I have is knowing that knower and known are one. Say the second again, VJ. I, I didn't grasp it. In the first one, knowing... No, no, the, the first one I understand. Just say the second. 
knowing that as if I the witness, knowing that knower and known as one. Well, the thing about what you just said is it's an intellectual formulation. The only way to really grasp or apprehend, as Cindy so appropriately used the word, the only way to really apprehend this is to reach Savikalpa Samadhi. Then you understand that there is only one, and somehow your sense of yourself is just a tiny, tiny, tiny point of awareness within that oneness. And even that then disappears. And there's just this, this sense of wonder at the oneness but it's still an experience, but knower, known, and knowing are all one. The experience is one with that which is known. But that is knowledge with a capital K, that is apprehension rather than an intellectual understanding of it. It's, it's good to have an intellectual understanding of it. It's wonderful to have an intellectual understanding of it. But to apprehend it, we have to go within. Brother Shankar, that tiny, minuscule that you just spoke of, would that be the one that Swami Bhaskaranaji said, there is that little ego left in me that I need to run the center. Precisely. That is that is what he was pointing to. What what Vijay is talking about is he went to see Swami Bhaskarananda in Seattle, and Seattle uh, is a, 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 an old and successful center. Bhaskarananda has run it for many years. And what he said to Vijay was, mother has left, and he made this gesture uh, of just this much ego. Uh, she has left just this much ego in me in order to run the center. Mm -hmm. Meaning that all of the other aspects of ego had disappeared and that she had left him with the ego of wisdom and love, that slender thread of ego that Sri Ramakrishna speaks of, in order to run the center. If that disappeared, he would no longer be able to run the center. Toward the end of his life, Swami Brahmananda actually forgot how to sign his name. So the, this, you know, he would go in and out of uh, having that slender thread of ego. He would, he would. Uh, uh, anyway, just that. So uh, yes, that's exactly what Swami Bhaskarananda meant. Uh, I have a question in terms of checking the ego. I have over a period of time, grown into the habit of silently within myself, checking, asking myself, is what happened, reflecting my ego. And uh, a case in point, a very subtle one, recently only, from last week, I happened to get an email from a very respected, learned professor in Hindi from India asking for my welfare. I felt very moved 
And my immediate response was to reply immediately. It's been five days now, and I've held, my, held myself back consciously each day. I'm just savoring that feeling, thinking that if I reply to her, I'll be losing that joy as it. And I'm asking myself, is that my ego? Is holding well, me back? You identify it however you care to, VJ. You know, what is it that enjoys? There's only one enjoyer. But you keep holding on to it as if it's yours. You say, I've I've deliberately held back for five days, you know, and that's not wrong or bad or anything of that kind. It's just that you know the, the enjoyment was in the moment. Now you're just holding to that enjoyment. But the enjoyer has moved way past that. So you're being, you're feeling gratified that someone of such stature, all, all the things that we can think about, nothing bad or wrong. It's just, you will be freer, you will be less limited if you simply reply and move on, if that's the, if that's the content of your question. It is. Thank you. It, that helps. So, because then your awareness can move into what is present. It is this moment that is full of new possibility. Thank you very much. So anything that blocks your attention from we're, we're not here, Rajiv. We're not hearing you. I don't know what's wrong, but we're not hearing you. It's all garbled. So can you? Can so, you? There we go. Now we can hear you. So anything that is blocking your attention from the present moment, like anything that disturbs you, or it could be joy or it could be sadness or it could be anger whatever it is but not joy but it could be like pleasure it could be a sadness whatever like sometimes you keep on ruminating on old stuff and getting happy so that is also a distraction and we should avoid that right if you want to become free if you want to become free you will avoid it should should i don't know about should shoulda woulda coulda no 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 it just depends on what your wishes are, what your priority is. If you wish to experience the fullness of the present moment, you will do your best not to dwell in the past or project yourself into the future. There is so much richness in the present moment, but as you said, we distract ourselves from that by ruminating, you use that word very appropriately ruminating in other words like a chow uh, like a cow chewing its cud for the third time uh that's fine for a cow it's required for its digestion for the mind it is just simply a limitation so <clears throat> but when we find ourselves doing it what is to be done simply recollect the truth that that which I'm ruminating on is no longer present. Something else is present in this moment. What is it? <clears throat> that is a less limited and more free way to be. And there's more power in it to fully be what is appropriate, auspicious in the present moment. As long as we're dwelling in the past or projecting into the future, we're 
avoiding the possibilities of the present moment. That crouching, pregnant moment. Thank you for bringing that out, Raji. And speaking Thank of... Thank you, Brother Chakra, for a beautiful clarification and awareness. Yes. Brahmadas, you had something? Yes. We were talking about ruminating on the shoulda, woulda, couldas, and we all struggle with that. But I find here that the Swami Prabhupananda himself struggled with that. I see at the bottom of page 448, he says, this is one of the first vows we take. I will not brood over my past mistakes when I go to meditate. When I go to think of God, I'll think myself pure, free, divine. So even these God-realized masters struggled with that. We're not the only ones. Oh, of course not. Uh, if you want to know more about that, just read the last two chapters of Crest Jewel of Discrimination. As long as we're embodied, we're, we're dealing with the karma that brought us here. And so, yes, that embodiment, the five organs of action, the five organs of perception, as long as they are present to us, they have their effect. And so we must constantly be on the alert, as Adi Shankaracharya points out, not to be dragged away from the perfection of the moment into some lesser uh, representation of reality, some more relative reality than the full reality of of the realized soul. Very well said and very well noted, Ramadas. So, Brother Shankara, it's a matter of degree, you know, like you said, even the realized souls or the embodied souls. But for us ordinary householders and unrealized souls, it's a matter of degree, you know, to which... Yes, but you can meet that degree with the fierceness of a lion and the simplicity of a child, which is what we'll talk about tomorrow. Oh. Those are the components of Shraddha, courage and the simple faith of a child with its hand in its parent's grasp. Not grasping its parent's hand. Mm -hmm. its hand in its parents grasp we Literally. do not need to be victim to anything brother brother i want to make a note like when i was in india like you know in india my relatives and everybody like you know we have culturally there's spirituality and many people discuss a lot and you know and, and then you talk about uh, you talked about uh, understanding and apprehension, and you know we can keep on discussing for four hours like normally, and and but in the times of truth, it all breaks down, and you know, and, and then at a point you feel sick of it. Like, can I just give it all up? You know. <laughs> well, the, ultimately, we do give it all up, but not in a negative sense. As as Swami. Yogatmananda pointed out one time when he came to speak here, when you get on an airplane and you have an assigned seat, you go to that seat, you sit in that seat, and for the duration of the flight, that is your seat. When you arrive at your destination, you don't say, oh, I want to take my seat with me. I, I'm going to miss my seat. No, you get up and leave your seat. 
And so this is the way we need to be with our experiences. That was then, this is now, what does that have to do with now? Most of the time we'll find it has nothing to do with now and is simply limiting and interfering with our ability to apprehend the moment. So yes, intellectual discussion, all that business we can is, but that doesn't mean that as, as a congregation studying the art of spirituality together, that we shouldn't have these discussions. Yeah, I meant uh, not as a, under the, like the influence of a teacher or guru or guide and like satsang, but sometimes we can take these things and make a materialism out of it. You know, I don't know. Oh, yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> we make that our... Uh, uh, this is why Sri Ramakrishna says in, in, in the Gita, these people that come to him and they can talk for hours about the scriptures. And they, and at the same time, he says, I can see who you are. You're attached to woman and gold. He was speaking to men. You're attached to woman and gold. You must, the, all of that you've been saying to me, you must assimilate this. You must assimilate this. What does assimilate mean? Assimilate means digest and make it part of your very being. You know, there are people who wear their scholarship like a great, <laughs> in the Beatles song, with newspapers stapled to their chest. You know, everything about all these stories about me and they were in the newspapers, you know. Oh. Brother, so, I also noticed yeah. that th there were so many gurus and like spiritual, like great, great spiritual gurus, but, and then they, you know, you have organizations that, but then it, it almost seems that Maya is so powerful that even with these spiritual organizations, there are like, and they have the highest of intentions, but people fight within them and for power and for glory and for title. Do you expect them not to be human beings, Rajiv? Do you expect them not to be human when they're embodied? Of course they'll do that. Don't judge them. Look at the, by their fruits, ye shall know them. What is it that they achieve? Yes, they'll fight with one another. Yes, they'll struggle for power. Yes, and it's and, and it can look sometimes very, very uh, like, oh, what are these people doing? But don't focus on that. What are they achieving? What are they doing? What are they actually accomplishing? By their fruits ye shall know them. And so, yes, they struggle. Yes, they continue to be human beings. Most of them, even in these organizations, and though they have been part of these organizations, they may have been swamis, whatever, they're not yet illumined. They're, they're, not, they're not even struggling the struggles of the illumined. They're struggling the same struggles we are at a different level, perhaps, as, as Nero pointed out earlier, it's a spectrum. But beware of judgment. Try and observe what is it that they've achieved with all of their, whatever it is that they, they, that's going on behind the scenes. What are they achieving? Does that make sense to you, Rajiv? Yes. Okay. Um, Brother Shankara. Yes, dear. I think, um, you know, persistence in um, the spiritual path will hopefully um, help us give it all up 
from a position of strength rather than a position of weakness. Amen, sister, exactly. From a position of strength. It's, it's like Yogatmananda said, when you then when the plane lands and you get up from the seat, you go on about your business and you leave that seat behind. Not, you know, out of, oh, well, I have to leave my seat now. No, you have something else to do. So you go and you leave that seat and that's no longer your seat. It becomes somebody else's seat on the next flight. <clears throat> that was that's where the that's where the metaphor breaks down of course i was thinking about this this morning this idea of things not being ours about uh how you know that this house i live in which i really enjoy quite a bit um it's not mine it's it's on loan <laughs> for a while and the land is not mine there's a piece of paper somewhere that says it is but uh, it's not. And I think one of the sticky, sticky things that we humans have is this, you know, this is mine. I worked for it. Um, I, this is mine and it's not yours. You can't have it. <laughs> um, that causes all the problems in the world. Very, really. very much so. Yes, dear, you're right. And if you, <laughs> All we have to do is contemplate death. You know, if you go back to the talks that were given about Don Juan Matus, the great uh, Yaki uh, teacher out of the Toltec tradition, he said, just imagine that death is a bird sitting on your left shoulder, a big, powerful bird sitting on your left shoulder. And you never know when it's going to peck you in the head. And this experience of being who you think you are will end. Then see how much you have this sense of it's mine. Because the moment that bird acts, that, that great bird of death acts, Everything you thought was yours is gone. The only thing that remains are the mental impressions. And even those aren't yours. They simply belong to the subtle body that if it is the auspicious thing to do, will take another body and those mental impressions will become the parabdha karma of that new body. But there won't be any house or car or wealth or family. All that's gone. So this I me mine attitude is just another limitation just another way of rendering ourselves limited rather than saying no the universe if anything is mine at all it is all of being i am one with it it is mine and i am its i am thine and thou art mine away from the I me mine to thou, thou, thou and thou alone. Understanding that this little point of awareness is somehow part of that thou. Brother Shankara? Yes. This beautiful example, a quotation that you just said about the huge bird sitting on the left left shoulder. Who is that by? Uh, this is uh, Don Juan Matus. Uh, if you go back to the talks that were given on the book, Journey to Ixtlan, I-X-T-L-A-N, Journey to Ixtlan. It's the 
recording of the experience of Carlos Castaneda, a PhD candidate at the University of California, Los Angeles, who encountered this yaqui brujo. Brujo doesn't translate any more than yogi does. Uh, it's often translated as, as sorcerer, but that's just foolishness. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's a, a man of knowledge, a human being of knowledge, capital K, and the manifestation of his knowledge. And he taught out of the Toltec tradition, which is one of the old spiritual streams that came out of what we now call Mexico. Uh, Don Juan Matus was a, uh, born into the Yaqui Indian tribe, clan, people, and he lived both in the United States and in Arizona and, and in, in uh, northern Mexico. He was an amazing, amazing human being, a realized soul. Thank you very much. And by any chance, do we happen to have this book around in the center? Uh, you can buy a copy online. Uh, okay. we, we don't sell it at the center, no. I have a copy of my own, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, Journey to Ishtlan. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you decide to read it, Vijay, please don't read it alone. Uh, discuss it regularly. We could have a private uh, class on the book if you wish. But why don't you just go back and listen to the talks given on it first? They were uh, over a month's worth of talks, Sunday talks, given on that book. And uh, what time you, may find that you may find that you don't need to buy the book. The talks you mean given by you on a Sunday? Yes. Okay, a month back, okay. You'll find them in the archive. Okay. Thank you. And so Shankar, two questions, please. One, page 448, that we were discussing just a short while ago, that uh, I will not brood over my past mistakes when I go to meditate. Yes, meditation is certainly understandable for this moment. But when I go to Thakur and I'm asking help, at that time, I am thinking of my past mistakes. That's why I'm asking him for help. Well, that's your business, Vijay. You handle it as you see fit. Just realize it's a limitation. Just, just ask for help with what's happening right now. Uh, ask to be with the master. If you wish to be less limited, and don't worry about what happened in the past or asking for any help with it. Just ask for you know, the, the simplest way to do it, VJ, is to simply say, Master, have mercy on me. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Om Amen. And then just start repeating your mantra. You were given a mantra full of power by Swami Yogeshananda. That will center you in the moment and the great discoveries that await you in the moment. That's my instruction. Thank you. My second question was a while ago when I mentioned to you that I'm savoring that 
special feeling that I had upon hearing from this person, this uh, writer. Uh, is that an ego to my tendency to savor? Dear heart, you define it as you see fit. It, it's an attachment. It's an attachment to something that happened. You define it as you see fit. Uh, you know, there is, the Swami just got through saying in what we read that you have no ego. There is no such thing as your ego. Attached. But we have this, we have this ignorance that is formed of attachment and aversion and hatred and shame and pride and all of the eight fetters. There is no ego. He even quoted Sri Ramakrishna as saying, you try to find the ego is like by peeling the onion. You peel it and peel it and peel it and peel it to find out where the onion is. And there is none. It's you simply peel it till there's nothing left. The, those peelings are our Mental impressions are some scars and vasanas that are that as long as we attend to them, they will continue to be present to us. As long as we give them our attention, they will continue to flourish, flourish. If we deny them their th that attention, these attachments, aversions, hatreds, all of these samskaras, mental impressions, if we deny them our attention and focus it instead on something higher, then they wither. Ultimately, they become dormant. And when realization is achieved before or at death, then they are extinguished they become as this as it's written about by adi shankaracharya they become ashes lifeless unable to propagate thank you brother shankara yes dear cindy's comments about you know the house not being hers or ours brought to my mind this joke that I think I heard in one of Swami Sarvapriyananda's uh, lectures. <laughs> so this um, very successful, famous scientist um, dies and then he goes to heaven or wherever, meets with God and before deciding where to place him, God is asking him, okay, so what did you do? So the scientist goes, oh, I was so successful and I had this laboratory where had all these things and gadgets and I manufactured a whole human being. So the God says, oh, wow, you did. Tell me how. So the scientist starts by saying, oh, first I mix these five elements. And God says, okay, stop right there. You first learn to manufacture those five elements and then come back. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The, I've heard the same joke where <laughs> say, you know, I, I could I could make a better universe, um, you know, and, and starting with this world, and uh, and God says, uh, uh, "How will you do that?" Well, first uh, I I'll need some dirt, and God says, "Get your own dirt." <laughs> so, uh, this, so this is uh, it's. <laughs> yes, we don't do anything. This is the this is the thing. We are we are at play as at being and creating and doing and sharing. These are the joys of why we're here. But it's all a transparent illusion. And at some point, for whatever reason, 
you say, well, enough. There must be more. This feels limited. I feel an ache for something more. What is that something more? And the Swami said, that is the Atman. That is Brahman. That is God. That is what you're aching for. That lost knowledge that that is what is true. Not this player in time, space, and causation. Not that there's anything wrong in it. There's absolutely nothing wrong in it. Unless you're harmful to others, and even that from one perspective is not wrong. You just become the, the messenger for their karma. But that's a whole other conversation and really not a very fruitful one. So the, the idea is to recollect who you truly are. And the Swami has said, you're not that ego. You can't find that ego. You are, there is no such thing as your ego. You're manufacturing it out of your, in your knowledge of name and form and your past experiences and your expectations of future experiences. You're creating this sense of individuality and separateness out of all that. It's I, me, mine. My experiences, my gunas, my this, my that, my the other thing. Well, so it seems. But, as the Swami says, seek to know that I. That is the Atman, that is Brahman, that is God. When the great sage Udalaka in the Chandogya Upanishad says to his son, Tat Tvam Asi, that thou art. It became one of the four great sayings of the Upanishads, the Mahabhakyas that thou art. And you will know it or not know it as pleases yourself. And there's no compulsion to know it. There is no should, there is no dogma. There is the announced purpose of human life as given to us by Vivekananda, the each soul, each, each saguna atman, each apparent human being, each soul is potentially divine. It is potentially that full nirguna atman. The purpose of human life is to manifest that divinity. Do this through work or worship, or psychic control, or philosophy, one or more, or all of these, and be free. Everything else, and he goes through the list, everything else is a secondary detail. We can hypnotize ourselves with the details, or we can Enjoy being alive without being attached to it. That's what Sri Ramakrishna says. You come to the mango grove, eat the mangoes, but don't count the trees, don't count the limbs on the trees, don't count the leaves on the limbs. Don't get hypnotized with why there are mangoes. Eat the mangoes and seek to know who you truly are.
Well, my goodness, it's 1.30. <laughs> it's really 1.30? All right, dears. <laughs> I had no idea it was so late. Uh, we can pick this up with our Holy Mother used to say next week. Any final thoughts or concerns or anything to share from any of you? Om Shankaraji, the only thing that comes to my mind is what Sridharananda says, divinize everything, any yeah. act, any thought, any experience, divinize it 24-7. Exactly, Bala Krishna. If we just say, take both my vice and virtue. Yes. Yes, divinize your life. This is what he said. And his formula for that is, we start with the idea I am, which is manifestly the case in relative reality of time, space, and causation. Who can deny? I am. At a certain point, we come to the conclusion that I am, but there is something beyond, something much bigger than myself. And so we come to I and thou. And then we see, oh, that thou is primary, that thou is consciousness, and out of that consciousness is my awareness. So it becomes, instead of thou and I, it becomes it, instead of I and thou, it becomes thou and I in their relative statures. And finally, one grasps, one apprehends that there is only thou. And that this sense of being separate in any way is just a limitation of our being. Should you hurry, as pleases yourself, there is no should. Thank you, Bala. Anything else from anyone? All right, dears. This has been, as always, a joy. Om Asatoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amrutangamaya Abir Abir Moiti. Keeping in mind that this is a prayer, the prayer says in English, O oh, dearly beloved Lord, lead us, lead us, take me by the hand and lead me from this realm of noisy confusion and delusion to thine abode of serenity, silence, and clarity. Lead us, lead me from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us, lead me from death to immortality. Light us, light me, through and through with thy everlasting, shining presence. Om Hari Om Tat Sat. Om dearly beloved, make it so. Shanti, 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 he peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. 
May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. Any final thought from anyone? All right, until tomorrow morning, for those of you who choose to join us, it'll be, the talk will be about what attitude is appropriate for the Raja Yogi. December is a month to talk about Raja Yoga. But two other things will happen this month besides me chattering away at you. First is next, the, the week after next, on December 12th, we will have Sister Eleanor Francis, an Episcopalian nun and an amazing woman. There'll be a little biography of her in next week's newsletter. And a, an Episcopalian nun and on December 12th, she will speak to us about St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, she's made a deep study of St. Teresa, and it, 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 I can guarantee you it will be an awesome talk. <clears throat> then we'll talk on December the 19th. I will talk about the Raja Yoga of Lord Jesus Christ. And then on the 26th of December, we will celebrate Holy Mother's birthday, Sri Sharada Devi's birthday. It comes on the 20, it comes on the 26th of December this year. I'm hoping, though I have not established it for a fact yet, that Aditya Chaturvedi will be able to do our puja and that we'll be able to zoom it from the shrine as we have been done before. All that remains to be established, but you'll hear about it uh, in the newsletter and on the website and so on. So. Brother Shankara. Yes, dear. This is Triguna. I would like to talk to you sometime, just a few minutes. Well, why don't you, why don't you uh, uh, call me right after the talk? Okay, I'll do that. Thank oh, you. you. You have my cell phone number, yes? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay, well, right, right now, or just oh, after sure. we finish, why don't you call? Sure, me? sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Until next time, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. And away we go. <laughs>